We're looking at seven lighthouses in the book of Revelation. If you take your Bibles, go to Revelation chapter 2. A candlestick, a lighthouse, same difference. This church ought to be a lighthouse. And I pray that our light will shine even brighter this year than it's ever shined in the past. The last words of Christ, as Matt said this morning, are found here in these seven letters to these seven churches. And keep that in mind. This is not what John has to say to these churches. This is what Jesus has to say. That puts a lot more uh, emphasis on this. And we've been talking about what would Jesus say if he wrote to us. And if we look at this, there are certain things that we need to apply to ourselves. We need to examine ourselves as we study these seven letters and uh, see if there may be places where we need to repent and uh, make some changes. In these seven areas in Asia Minor, did you find us a map, Rick? Uh, I'm going to show you a map of this to give you an idea of what we're talking about. <clears throat> you see Ephesus down here at the bottom. This was a Roman road that connected all of these cities. And you would go up to Smyrna, Sardis, Thyatira, Pergamum, uh, come on around, and uh, Philadelphia, Laodicea. You see Colossae down here. We have a, an epistle to the Colossians. And uh, so it's believed that the church in Ephesus may have started the other six churches. That was the big church that Paul had built, Timothy had pastored, John had pastored. It was a great missionary church. And it's believed that all these other churches were established through the outreach of the church in Ephesus. And so we're just going to kind of make the circle here and visit these different places and uh, see what the Lord had to say to them. Let's look at chapter 2 now, beginning with verse number 12 for our text tonight. We've already noted two churches, the one in Ephesus, the one in Smyrna. Now to the angel of the church in Pergamos, right? Now, who did we say the angel is? Don't forget it now. The angel of the church is the pastor. That just means he's God's messenger planted in that church to share the gospel, to, to preach the word of God. So to the angel, this was the pastor who was going to read this letter to the church. These things saith he which hath the, sh the sharp sword with two edges. You'll notice each church gets a, the reference to Christ back in chapter 1 we looked at. He breaks down parts of that and applies it to each of these seven churches. And there are certain things about Christ that these churches especially needed to remember. And the church of Pergamos needed to remember that Christ is he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and hast not denied my name, my faith. You've held fast my name, and hast not denied my faith. Even in the days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a, st a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth that stone. So let's look at this tonight. Again, first of all, you have a word of commendation to this church in Pergamos. 
See that in verse 13. He commends them for some things. He commends them for their loyalty to the Lord's person. He, he notes where they are living. They are living where Satan's throne is. He said, I know where thou dwellest. Evidently, they were living in the center of satanic activity. Uh, significantly, the symbol of worship there in this city was the serpent. And uh, that is one of the manifestations of the devil. There was a snake cult there that worshipped the serpent. There was a power of darkness there that was very, very strong. Can you imagine living where Satan has made his headquarters? I wonder where it's at today. Somewhere Satan has established his headquarters. And he moves it from time to time. During this time, it was in Pergamos. I believe one time it was in Babylon. Maybe it's in Rome, getting ready for the Antichrist. By the way, let me... The devil does not live in hell. I don't know if anybody is confused about that, but the devil does not rule over hell. As far as I know, he's never been there. And on top of that, he's not looking forward to going there. The devil's not ruling over hell. He will suffer in hell probably more than any creature that God's going to cast into that place. So don't get the idea that he likes the fire and enjoys himself in hell. He's going there one day, but he's not looking forward to it. So Satan worship was strong here in Pergamos. I think it goes back to Babylon to the time of Nimrod. I think all pagan religion and false Christianity is rooted in the mystery Babylon religion. It's always been Satan's ambition to exalt himself. He wants to be worshipped. His demons want to be worshipped. And those who get involved in paganism and false religion, in essence, they are worshipping Satan. Now, some things you need to know about Satan. Satan is not omnipresent. What does that mean? To be everywhere at the same time. Now, God is omnipresent. God is everywhere. You cannot confine God to any particular place. But that's not true of the devil. If the devil's here tonight with us, he's nowhere else. He can only be at one place at a time. Now, I imagine he can move pretty quickly. He could probably... Go from here to the other part of the world in, in maybe a second. I don't know. I'm sure he gets around quickly. But he's not omnipresent. He is not omniscient. Only God is omniscient. Only God is all-knowing. Now, the devil has an evil genius. But he must learn. He uses trial and error to oppose God. He's got these methods that, that he's been using for a long time. And he knows what works in deceiving people. But he's not omniscient. He is not omnipotent. Am I impressing anybody with these big words? What's omnipotent? That's all powerful. We say God is almighty, right? God is almighty. There is nothing God cannot do. But that's not true of the devil. The devil is very powerful, but his power has limits. God's got him on a pretty short leash. And God knows what the devil's up to. He knows where his headquarters are, and he knows where we are. He knows where we live. He knows what conditions we're living under. And we've talked about this from time to time, about people come to us and, 
And they say, Brother Wes, would, would you pray that I can find another job? I'm the only Christian on my job. We say, praise God. We're so glad you're there because there needs to be a light there. If you leave, there's going to be no light. You may be the only light on your job. You may be the only light in your class at school. You may be the only light in your neighborhood, maybe even in your family. You may be the only one in your family that is trying to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. God knows where you're at. And God will help you to be a testimony and a witness in that place. Now think about this. God has a church here in Pergamos right on the doorstep of hell's headquarters. I like that. Amen. There needs to be a church there. Hey, we got some really dark places in the world today, and we need to plant churches in those places. There needs to be a light where people can openly profess the Lord Jesus Christ. Then you see when they are living, even in the days of martyrdom, when Antipas was martyred, evidently a, a very faithful servant of the Lord, suffered martyrdom there in Pergamos. He refused to deny Christ. He would not deny the faith. And as, as Matt preached this morning, that was pretty typical in the first century. These Christians suffered a lot of persecution. As Matt pointed out, we don't, we're not called upon to suffer like that, are we? But what if we are? What if in these last days, and folks, you see it coming in America, don't you? I mean, to be a fundamental Bible-believing Christian is mocked today in America. They're trying to take away a lot of our rights and liberties. Don't be surprised if, if the Lord delays His coming. This kind of persecution may come to America. How will we stand if it does come? Are we training our children to take a stand if persecution should come? We cannot compromise, can we? We can never compromise when it comes to the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only their loyalty to the Lord's person, but you see their loyalty to the Lord's precepts. They defended the faith. They were commended for this. Thou hast not denied my faith. And they're talking about my doctrine. You see that in Jude verse 3. When Jude said it was needful, for me to write unto you and exhort you that she should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. That faith is talking about that body of doctrine that Christ and the apostles once delivered to the saints. It's been passed on down to us, hasn't it? We've got to contend for that. We've got to take a stand for the truth of God's word. By the way, that word Antipas means against all. Sounds like a Baptist, doesn't it? He's against all. He's against everything. But I think what it means here is he was willing to take a stand against all false doctrine and remain true to the faith. Are we willing to do that today? Hey, here's a church faithfully holding to the great precepts of the Bible. The great doctrines. They held to the virgin birth of Jesus. They held to his miraculous life, his atoning death, his bodily resurrection, his ascension back into heaven, his second coming. They didn't deny any of those. But you know a lot of churches do today? I, I, and I say church in a very loose manner. They call themselves churches, but the candlestick has been long gone. They deny the faith. They don't stay true to the precepts that have been passed on. So the Pergamos church victoriously withstood the outward enemy, but somehow gave in to the inner enemy. They tolerated two false doctrines. So that brings us secondly to a word of correction. 
The Lord has a word of correction for this church. They tolerated, number one, the doctrine of Balaam. That is defiling the holiness of the church. The doctrine of Balaam can be seen in three parts. First, it deals with the wisdom of the world. Apparently, there was no discipline in this church when it came to false teachers. They were loyal to the first principles of the faith, and yet they were tolerating some new things that were coming along. The doctrine of Balaam. What in the world is that? Who was Balaam? There was a guy in the Old Testament named Balaam, right? Remember the story of Balaam? You read about it in Numbers chapter 22 through 25. That's telling the story of Israel conquering Canaan land. And King Balak of Moab hired a prophet named Balaam, evidently a Gentile prophet. He wanted Balaam to put a curse upon the Israelites. But Balaam knew that God had blessed these people and he could not put a curse on them. So he showed Balak how he could defeat them by guile. The Moabites were advised, instead of fighting against the Israelites, fraternize with them, intermarry with them, and lead them into idolatry. That's exactly what they did. If he can't curse them, we'll corrupt them. And that's what they did. And Satan is behind that. Satan is that evil genius behind things like this, seeking to corrupt the disciples of Christ. We've got to be careful, don't we? We've got to put on the whole armor of God that we might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So there's the wisdom of this world we've got to deal with. Then there's the worship of this world. Go to, go to Numbers 25 with me. Let me just point out something here about that story of Balaam. Let me show you what happened. In Numbers 25, look at verses 1 through 3. And Israel abode in Shedem, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. They were following the advice of Balaam. They were fraternizing with the Moabites, intermarrying with them. And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods. And the people did eat and bow down to the gods of the Moabites. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor, one of their, one of their chief gods. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. Go to 30, chapter 31 and look at verse 16 with me. Numbers 31, verse 16. Behold, these caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor, and there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. See, the devil knew if he could corrupt God's people and get them involved in bringing idolatry into their worship, God would chasten them. God would judge them. And that's exactly what happened. And the devil knows that's still true today. Modern idolatry is very subtle. The doctrine of Balaam in our day and time would be to bring some object between God and the believer. That's idolatry. Anything you allow to come before God is an idol. And there's many idols around today. You may not bow down to a statue or an image, but that image begins with the imagination. It begins in your thinking. So there's a lot of idolatry around today. And there were those in the church in Pergamos that thought it's okay to, to bring in some of the practices and, and beliefs of the pagans into their worship. They wanted to mix it up a little bit. That's still going on today, folks. A lot of churches want to bring in worldly methods. 
and incorporate them into our worship. I think well, there's no harm in mixing a little bit of the world's music and a little bit of the world's thinking and, and such as that into our worship. No, God condemned that. He condemned it with the Israelites and he condemns it in the church age. Then there's the wickedness of this church. Or the wickedness of this world, I mean. The Israelites were tempted into committing fornication by practicing the immoral ceremonies of paganism. Write this verse down, James 4.4. 4. There were warned, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Friendship with the world puts you at odds with God. Now, we are to make friends of the people in this world to win them to Christ. But we cannot lock arms with them and do what they do and go where they go and dress like they dress and talk like they talk. We've got to be different. That new morality is nothing but pagan immorality. There's many today who are in churches that have become desensitized to sin. They leave church, go home, and giggle at the obscenity portrayed on television. Amen? The immorality of this world doesn't bother them. It's accepted. Now, it seems to me that there are church members that just seem to want to know how far in the world can I go without getting in trouble. Preacher, can I do this? Preacher, can I go there? You know, if you have to ask, probably know the answer but we want to know how close can I live to the world and not get in trouble with God no that's the wrong thinking you need to be thinking how far from the world you can get get as far away from it as you can and don't be corrupted by the things of this world that's the doctrine of Balaam. Then there's the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. We've met them before, haven't we? We, re we heard about the deeds of the Nicolaitans in Ephesus, but now it's the doctrine of the Nicolaitans in Pergamos. What was first tolerated as an unscriptural practice now is accepted as a principle. Remember I told you Nicolaitan comes from two Greek words. You know what, Nike? Anybody wearing Nike? Nike was a, a pagan god. Laity is people. I mentioned before, uh, there's this idea of Nicolaitanism. You got the clergy, you got the laity. You got the leaders, and you got the people. So, Nicolaitanism is conquering the people. There emerged a church government of hierarchy that lorded over God's people. Remember, Peter warned about that. He told the elders, don't lord over God's people. But you see that today. You might think, well, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is God hates it. Twice Jesus says, I hate this. He said it to the Ephesians. He says it now to the per." To the people in Pergamos, I hate this. I hate it when people lord over my churches. Christ is the head of the church. Not the Pope. No cardinal, no bishop. No prophet. She got them all over the place today. And now the ones that you don't question me. I am of God. And they want to be followed blindly. Watch out. God hates lust for religious power. By the way, the word Pergamos means marriage. I think that's interesting. I've not brought this up, but you know, there's some that believe the seven churches represent seven periods of the church age. The Ephesus 
church representing the apostolic age and just right on down to our age, which would make us what? <laughs> the Laodicean age. Gump. I don't want to live in the Laodicean age. You say, well, what's that about? Well, hang around. We're going to get to that. The Laodicean church was the worst of all these churches. But some say, well, the Pergamos age would be the marriage of church and state. Pergamos means marriage, marriage of church and state. When did that happen? Old fellow named Constantine started that. The emperor of the Roman Empire became a Christian, and he stopped the persecution of Christians, and then he made Christianity the state religion of the Roman Empire. And there was a marriage there of church and state. The Catholic Church and the Roman Empire married. The emperor was the head of the church until they lost their empire, and then it went to the pope, the bishop of Rome. Folks, this is what the Lord hates. Say, Brother West, you shouldn't say that. Well, don't you don't say it if you think it's bad, but... Don't, don't mess with my preaching because I think that's exactly what we're seeing here. Go to Matthew 23. Y'all got me stirred up now. Matthew 23. I get a hard look. It makes me want to preach more. Matthew 23. Look, look at this. In verse 8. This is Jesus talking to his disciples here. He says, Be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. Call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. Now don't call me Father West. I ain't your daddy. I'm Brother West. I'm not your father, I'm your brother. God is your father. Christ is your high priest. And the idea of giving all this power and authority to the clergy can be traced right back to Nicolaitanism. And then you've got the marriage of church and state under Constantine. And God's going to deal with that one day. That's coming up in Revelation. Let me move on. Verse 16, back in our text, you have a word of counsel. Again, you have this repent or else. He says, repent or else, I'll come unto thee quickly. Don't be broad-minded. Don't tolerate the worldliness and false doctrine. Use some discipline. But what Jesus says, I will come unto thee, the church, and fight against them. You notice that? I will come unto thee and fight against them. Them's the false teachers. He's saying, look, if you don't deal with them, I will. And it's not going to be pretty when I come. I will deal with it. He commended the Ephesian church because they would not bear them which were evil. Now, folks, listen. The spirit of Balaam has gotten into so many churches today. And we only do the Balaamites harm by tolerating their worldliness. We're told judgment must begin at the house of God. 1 Peter 4, 17. There's a tendency among many to serve God only when it's convenient to do so. So many people today, they try to keep their religious life separate from their secular life. They really are allowing the world to dictate how they live. They follow all the new trends in dress. They let the world decide how they dress. Some of you, you let the world dictate how you dress. Amen. Lord doesn't like it. Getting involved in activities 
which will ruin your testimony and affect your fellowship with the Lord. To a preacher, I don't like to mix my religion with my business. Really. Folks, you can't be true to the Lord dividing your life into two parts. It's not about serving God on Sunday and living like the world the rest of the week. Remember the, the, the Kendrick brothers that made some movies. Have you seen Flywheel? How many have ever seen the movie Flywheel? you got to talk about a movie, so it's my turn. Raise your hand. How many have seen Flywheel? You're too religious to watch TV, aren't you? This has been on television recently, and Betty and I watched it. We like the kids. They're Christian-based movies. And if you see it, watch it. It's a good movie. It's about a car lot owner who was about to lose his car lot because of his indebtedness and his shadiness. He'd been cheating people. He even cheated his pastor. Charged his pastor too much for a vehicle. That's a sin unto death, by the way. I'll let you know about that. But God started convicting him, and his wife was giving him a hard time, and finally he repented, asked God to forgive him, and said, God, I'm just giving you this car lot. We're going to run it on your principles. And he started treating people honestly. And, and God blessed in a great way. He sent an undercover reporter. A, a news network was doing undercover reporting on car lots. They sent six guys out to six car lots. And only this guy's car lot came back with a good report of being honest and dealing with his, own, with his customers. So they put that on the air. The next day, a great crowd of people comes to his car lot. He sells out every car on the lot in one day. They found an honest car lot. And it just showed how God blessed this man for stepping out and saying, I'm going to do it God's way. I think God will bless if you'll do it his way. Then finally, a word of comfort. Three thoughts real quick here. You see, his infinite resources for overcomers. Eat of the hidden manna. Manna came down from heaven, right, to feed the Israelites when they were in the wilderness. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I am that manna that came down from heaven. What about hidden manna? Manna wasn't hidden. It was right out there on the ground. They could go out and pick it up and eat it. Where was, where was our hidden manna? How about in Ark of the Covenant? Remember that? Remember they took some manna and put it in a pot, and they put that in the Ark of the Covenant. So that was the hidden manna. To eat the hidden manna, I think probably would be symbolic of us feasting on the Lord Jesus Christ, the manna now hidden in heaven in the Holy of Holies. Now, if you prefer the banquet of the world and not the bread of heaven, you need to make some changes. Eat of the hidden manna. Feed upon that. Not only the infinite resources there, but his instant reception of overcomers. He mentions a white stone here. What's that all about? It may speak of a covenant relationship that was common back in that day and time. A white stone would be taken and broken in half. And on each half was written the name of the person entering into a covenant with another person. I would write my name on my half. Matt would write his name on his half. I would give him my stone. He would give me his. Whenever I journeyed through the kingdom of Matt, not needed anything, I could just show that stone with Matt's name on it, which would allow me to have whatever I needed that was belonged to Matt. Same for him if he came through my kingdom. Assuming we had kingdoms, amen. That was the idea. They may even have secret names that they would use that only those two people would know. I think the idea here is we can have that kind of relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. We have his name and all his riches and power 
can be at our disposal as the overcomers. And then thirdly, his intimate revelation. Our relationship, our experience with the Lord Jesus as personal. No man knows what Jesus means to me, but me. Nobody knows what Jesus means to you, but you. Amen? That's a personal relationship. And we can communicate with Christ. And sometimes we really can't put into words what the Lord means to us. But we can show it in the way we walk. We can show it by the way we live a consistent life before others. Amen. Any church like Pergamos needs revival. Little leaven will leaven the whole lump. We need to examine ourselves and make sure we're not guilty of some of the things that they were guilty of. 